Hey everyone, welcome to week four of online education. And as we start this week, I uh, want to throw out the question of kind of how you're doing as we think about the days that have passed. Here we are two and a half weeks in, uh, three weeks since we were at school. Uh, how are you faring? Uh, where are some areas that maybe are points of struggle? Uh, maybe on the opposite end, what are some areas of joy? As you think about life right now, how are you doing? overall. As we went back and finished up last week, again, there were some very heavy parts, obviously, at the end, uh, talking about liber or about the selection, about coming to places like Auschwitz, and just the awful nature of what those places entailed. Uh, today, we're going to be wrapping it up, and honestly, it'll be fairly short in terms of uh, tying up that loose end, and then we'll begin looking at the war in the Pacific and how things are going to unfold there, especially with Japan. But let's go ahead and tie up, if we can, uh, dealing with these Nazi death camps. As we talked about those that went through selection, uh, you imagine just the horror and the terror that they had to experience, not only obviously in line and then as those went into those shower rooms, the Zyklon B, it had to be just horrifying realizing that life was coming to an end. But those that did survive, uh, it wasn't like life was going to be a picnic going forward. Uh, they had to do a lot of hard work, brutal conditions in terms of the cold, uh, obviously in terms of a lack of food, uh, just the bugs and germs that were going to be rampant in those camps. So it was going to be pretty rough. But there were others that I think, or would argue, had it even worse maybe than those that were going to be uh, out working for the Germans. And those were going to be those that were going to face uh, different tests. You can see the guy on the left, a guy by the name of Dr. Mengele. Joseph or Josef Mengele was going to be the main doctor, or one of the key guys at Auschwitz. He was often going to be participating in the selection process, but... One of the other things that he was responsible for doing was going to be conducting tests on the prisoners. He would um, cut bone and see how quickly people would heal, uh, looked at certain kinds of medicines and how they reacted to that. Uh, all of this without any type of real uh, positive medication. It wasn't like he was trying to make their experience better. He just was testing to see how they were going to react. The thing that's kind of creepy or the weirdest part of this is he was especially enamored with how twins would react to the same type of thing. So he would give um, twins and he would closely monitor to see how one twin might react differently than another. Some things that I've read said it was about uh, creating this master race and thinking about twins and how uh, that might look going forward. Dr. Mengele, uh, at the end of the war, was able to escape to Argentina, where he, along with many other Nazis, uh, escaped during that time and was able to live out the remainder of his days. I think died in the early to mid-70s, uh, but just an awful dude. Uh, you imagine, again, people like that will get their eternal reward, but very, very brutal thinking about people that suffered under his hand. Well, as the end of the war was getting closer, you're going to see there being these rumors of the camps, even in the mid-40s, uh, well, I guess early 40s, we're talking 42 or 43, there began to be rumors about these camps it wasn't a real specifically known thing, but rumors started to uh, percolate through to Allied Command, and finally there was a verification of the rumors. And as they would go through, especially into Germany, uh, there would be the opportunity to now not only set those that had been under German control free, but then to get toward some of these camps in Poland, especially uh, where some horrible atrocities that had been carried out. The hard thing, though, was as they got to liberate or were there to liberate, it was going to be a very difficult process. I'd like to talk about three areas that were going to be uniquely difficult. The first, the food that people were served had to be very, very carefully monitored. You imagine people had been starving for a year or two years, maybe even some of them two and a half, three, 
now they had the opportunity to eat like you or I, just as much food as they needed. However, they had to be very careful because their stomachs had so contracted that some people would literally eat themselves to death if given the opportunity. So they had to not starve them, but definitely closely monitor how much food they gave them so as to not make them even more sick. Another thing that had to be very closely watched was going to be disease. They had been exposed to all manner of different diseases, um, fleas and ticks and other um, just pestilence in these barracks, just people struggling, just trying to stay alive. And because of that now, as they came away from there, sometimes they would remain kind of, as we've talked about this word uh, a lot over the last month, quarantined in these camps. They wouldn't let them out because they were afraid of what else could be kind of set free if they were to release them. The third was going to be trying to get rid of those that had died in a respectful and honorable way. Unfortunately, though, even in some of these cases, they found that it was easier just to do mass graves because uh, they didn't necessarily know who the people were. And so just to respectfully but yet efficiently get rid of these people sometimes that was going to be the easiest thing to do very 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 hard you imagine just the emotional difficulty that would go along with that pretty rough by 1945 obviously the war is going to be over by the late summer but we're going to see early to mid 45 all these concentration camps have been gotten rid of here are some of the People being set free, you can see the sign over the top that work will set you free. Well, here is real freedom for these individuals as they were now liberated. Like I said, the, we were going to jump into the war in the Pacific. As we think about the Japanese, they've been growing in power. They've wanted to have more and more influence and say they wanted to be a superpower on the world scale. And by 1940, they had joined with the Germans and the Italians to form what was called the Tripartite Pact, essentially bonding these three. And they said, basically, if anybody was to be aggressive against them, there would be now an opportunity for these three to fight with and for each other. There had been a lot of conflict, even subliminally, between the United States and the Japanese. I think in many ways the Japanese felt threatened just based on the United States being in Southeast Asia. We have talked about the Philippines, we've talked about kind of America's involvement there, and as we, a result of that, they're saying, we want now there to be a limitation on what can happen here in our sphere. They want to now make sure that there isn't going to be just this huge widespread opportunity for attack. They're also going to now start attacking the Japanese are these imperially held areas of the ja or sorry of the French of the uh, Dutch even some English territories they said we want to now try to prove to the rest of the world that this is going to be an area for Asia not based on Europe this is going to be for us. The main uh, other enemy that was going to face the Japanese was going to be China. They want to now be the main uh, player within Asia. The United States said, we're not going to allow this kind of unbridled aggression to go on, to stand. And so they put a trade embargo on the Japanese. And essentially, the Japanese were told, unless you back down, we uh, are going to go to war. This is the beginning, but we're going to go to war if you do not leave China, because the Chinese have been our friend, and so we're going to now put this on the table. If you do not leave China, we're going to go to war. Japanese obviously are going to choose war. That's going to be their choice uh, versus peace. They said, no, we're not going to back down from this. This is something that we feel like we have to do. Even early on, the Americans had an opportunity to read what the Japanese were trying to say. We have this decoder called magic. We've also broken the German code by this point. Again, coded messages were a common thing sent back and forth. We've broken the German code using a machine called Ultra. Now we've established something called magic, which is now going to uh, decode and put into uh, understandable letters and words what the Japanese are trying to say. 
there's going to be a whole variety of messages that are going back. It's not only attack plans or whatever, but there are going to be a number of different types of messages going back, political, military, uh, just kind of information that's being passed back and forth that they don't want other people to be aware of. Well, the United States has begun getting an inkling that there was going to be an attack that was out there. We weren't sure when, we weren't sure where exactly. We just had an inkling that there was going to be an attack. Consequently, again, America is going to be um, have their radar up, but we have no clue what is going to be waiting for us in the early days of December of 1941. Well, when we come back, we'll talk a little bit about that. I'll have a video clip for you as well, and we will wrap up day one. See you guys then.